Hi guys and welcome to History Infection. This time I'm talking about influenza. But before I get into that, I'd just like to say thanks to Wildwood Claire One for giving me a shout out on her channel uh, during her Coffee with Claire segment on a Sunday. Uh, really big help. I've got some new subscribers, so hopefully you're going to stick around and enjoy the rest of the content I'm going to make on this channel. So nice to see you. Hopefully see more of you. I've also recently passed 500 subscribers, so. On that occasion, I'd like to do some shout outs of my own. The first is to The Nerd Report, who makes some great science based YouTube videos about how certain things work, like microwaves and how creatine doesn't kill you. YouTube John here. Today we're talking about hot things. No, not those kind of hot things. The secret behind the pepper's heat begins and ends with a group of chemicals called capsaicinoids. Meet my little friend, the habanero pepper. Until the year 2000, this was considered to be the hottest pepper in the world. For science, This is the moment I suddenly regretted everything I'd just done. Well worth checking out, go have a look and subscribe if you like. The second is The Gentleman Physicist, who makes great videos looking at different physics claims in the media and debunk, well sort of debunks them, and shows just where the media's got it wrong and how they can improve it, and also does some great work looking at idiots for physics where he builds a gigantic rope swing off a railway bridge from the looks of it, which even on video I look at and go, well, no, that's just silly. I don't care how good your mathematics are. You shouldn't be doing that. Holy hell, going first is not easy. No! Hey guys, last summer some friends of mine and I went out to a local railway trestle and did a 30 meter long rope swing. Before I went out, I made sure to go over some quick physics calculations to make sure the whole thing was safe. You know, calculate the maximum speed you'll be traveling at, find out how much force is going to be involved in the system to make sure the safety gear would hold up, and, well, to make sure they wouldn't tear us apart. This is the trestle. This is me. This is me swinging. To see how fast we can get going, all we need is the total length of the rope, which is about 30 meters. The potential energy at the top of the swing is my mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the length of the rope, ignoring air resistance. All the potential energy is converted to kinetic energy at the base of the swing. This is given by my mass times the velocity squared, all divided by 2. Okay, give myself a 10 to 5 count. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, well worth checking out. Go have a look at the video. Links to both these are in the descriptions. Go have a look at them. On to the science. Few could have thought that after surviving the awful trenches and going home to your loved ones, that within a few months you'd be laying, dying in your own bed due to some invisible foe. This is exactly what happened in 1918 thanks to the Spanish influenza. Around 50 million people worldwide are thought to have died due to Spanish flu. Some claim the number is actually around 100 million people. The name influenza is Italian for the influence. The name is used to describe how there seems to be such a strong agent behind how this disease spreads as if it was the stars themselves that cursed humanity. Influenza is normally just called the flu and it's in constant pandemic around the world, although different types of influenza spread from year to year. Recently we've seen pandemics from the bird flu, which is H5N1, and the swine flu, which is H1N1. These names are used to describe the structure of the virus. Here we see the flu virus and these are the structures that are used by the virus to attach to different types of cells. Depending on the receptor of the cell, these structures have a greater or lesser affinity for that type of cell. So this is in part of how the virus actually makes you sick. This is how it gets inside your cell. These structures, like most things biological, are under the control of genetic information, and this means that they can mutate. Different mutations might change the affinity of the structure for different types of receptor. So one receptor might have a greater affinity for getting into, say, a bird host than getting into a mammalian host. You yourself might have different structures on the outside of your cell, making you less susceptible to having the virus get into you. However, a virus might change or mutate its structure to make you more susceptible to that kind of virus. Kind of sounds like a positive mutation to me. The end part is the neuromididase, which is used by the virus to release its genetic information once inside the cell. The Spanish flu probably didn't originate in Spain. It's only really called that because it was only the Spanish newspapers that were reporting on its outbreak. The vast majority of the rest of the world media didn't really want to report that there was this horrible disease going around killing people regardless of the war. 
that the Spanish flu was a serotype H1N1, the same as the swine flu we recently saw. But why was it so dangerous? Why did it kill at least 50 million people worldwide. Well, when I was at university, the leading theory that was put forward for how and why the Spanish flu killed so many people was that it was due to secondary infections. The virus would cause irritation on parts of your endothelial cells in your throat and your lungs, which would open up the way for bacteria to get in and infect you as well. Suggested so along with this was the idea that if such an outbreak occurred today, we'd be fine because we could just treat the secondary infections with antibiotics. However, this was before we really knew what was happening with bird flu. Bird flu was quite a lucky escape for humanity worldwide, as it wasn't very easily spread from human to human. You had to be in quite close contact with an infected animal. An event known as zoonosis must have happened. It must spread from one type of animal to another, from bird to human. However, those who did become infected had a very high mortality rate. And what was causing this high mortality rate seemed to be something what's known as a cytokine storm. Now, your cytokines are tiny chemicals that go around your body, flagging up infection and damage. Immune cells release a whole raft of different cytokines, which cause all sorts of different interactions. It's incredibly complicated. To put it simply, cytokines are used to marshal your immune system cells. Your immune system is a fantastic system, but it can be very dangerous if it decides something isn't right. Overactivation of your immune system can cause catastrophic damage within your own body. You just have to look at any kind of autoimmune disease to see what kind of damage it can cause. The cytokine storm theory might also explain why so many healthy young adults died from the Spanish flu. Because they were young and healthy, they had a healthy immune system. A cytokine storm effectively leads to a person drowning in their own immune fluids and tissue damage in the lungs. So perhaps we've just been lucky since the Spanish flu outbreak and haven't had some sort of major pandemic like it. Well, in a way we have. We haven't had anything that's come close to killing as many people. But year on year, we have a pandemic flu season. The bird flu strain that caused the 2007 pandemic was first detected in 1996. That's 11 years before it really became well known. These flu systems are constantly ebbing and changing throughout time, depending on the population structure, the industry, the different animal vectors, etc, etc. So we can't really ever know when the next outbreak will occur. It's like any other natural disaster, be it volcano or earthquake. We can only prepare ourselves, we can only try and mitigate the effects of such a horrible natural disaster. I'll end with a quick but important distinction. A flu and a cold are not the same thing. Technically speaking, they're caused by two different viruses. A cold is normally caused by a rhinovirus. As this diagram shows, they look uncannily like rhinos. It's also been reported that a common cold can be caused by up to 200 different viruses, which as cliche as it is, means the common cold isn't so common after all. Also, when someone tells you you're not sick enough to have the flu, you just have a cold, I'd tell them that 30% of people who are infected with the influenza virus don't show any symptoms at all. So there's a continuum between dying from influenza and being absolutely fine from it. So you can't really distinguish on the basics of symptoms without doing actual tests whether or not you have the flu or just a cold. So that's a short history of influenza. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you have, feel free to subscribe and like. If you've got any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll try to get back to you. Please do check out those two channels I did shout out for. They're both fantastic and deserve more subscribers. Um, I hope you'll join me next time when I'll be talking about a short history of prion or prion diseases such as Kuru and CJD. Thanks for watching. See you next time.